cult psychodrome groups and destructive organizations thrive on a single insidious truth. People are most susceptible to manipulation when they are hurting. The flame of hope dims during periods of immense personal struggle, creating a prime opportunity for groups offering answers and a sense of belonging. And the manipulative recruitment tactics employed by Jehovah's Witnesses is a case study, highlighting how they mirror those used by other cults across the spectrum. Jehovah's Witnesses are known for their persistent door-to-door -door ministry and more recently their court witnessing. While this might seem like a random approach, there's often a calculated method at play. Apart from being trained to recruit from the platforms at Kingdom Walls and conventions, they have a series teaching recruitment tactics on their JW Broadcasting website. Jehovah's Witnesses outreach often targets neighborhoods grappling with social or economic hardships where residents may be more receptive to messages of hope and a brighter future. Young people are especially susceptible to these techniques. I know I was. I was trying to make sense of my world, of my place in the world, and what the future holds. The recruitment process itself is meticulously crafted. Initial interactions are friendly and non-threatening. Witnesses often strike up casual conversations inquiring about a resident's well-being. This seemingly innocent approach allows them to identify individuals exhibiting signs of vulnerability, such as those recently widowed, unemployed, or struggling with personal turmoil. During these times, individuals may seek solace, answers, or a sense of belonging, making them susceptible to the allure of cults promising community, purpose, and salvation. Hi, I'm Taylor, and this is Iron Sharpens Iron. Today we're going to practice how to start a conversation that could lead to a witness. Now for many, this can be terrifying. Why? Well, as soon as we see someone that we'd like to talk to, we can start to think to ourselves, what am I going to say? How am I going to give a witness? Or how are they going to react? And we can become so overwhelmed with anxiety or nerves thinking about how the conversation will end that we never even start. So here's something that we must keep in mind. Our goal is simply to start a conversation. So if we've started a conversation, we've succeeded, we've reached our goal, then we can just relax and see if it leads to a witness. So when we see someone that we would like to talk to, we wanna keep these three steps in mind. Number one, be friendly. And that's it. Just be friendly. Now we could be nervous, so we can say a quick prayer to Jehovah to give us courage, but then we can give a friendly greeting. Then we can mention something that's happening right then and there. Maybe the weather, the long line at the grocery store, their nice car, or another genuine compliment. Step two, let the conversation progress naturally. Don't rush it. If the conversation ends before we're able to give a witness, it's okay. We accomplished our goal. We started a conversation. Now we're ready to try again. Now, if the conversation continues on, then we can look for an opportunity to take step three, make a simple expression of our faith. Seven verses after Jesus started the conversation with the Samaritan woman, then he witnessed to her. He said he had water that imparts everlasting life. But between those two points, uh, he didn't lecture her. He let her talk and express herself, and he listened to what she had to say. So with those three steps in mind, now it's our turn. It's our turn to practice starting a conversation that could lead to a witness. Now tied in with us, we have Thais and Carolina, who have joined us for a demonstration. So where are you going to try to start your conversation today? We are in a department store. Yes, we are in a Portuguese congregation, and it's common to hear people speak Portuguese when they're out shopping. Excellent. So you've heard the three steps that we want to try. But first, let's see what could happen if we rush the conversation. 
Ok. Oi, tudo bem? I heard you speak in Portuguese. Where are you from? Oi, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. I'm from São Paulo. How long have you been here? Just three months. It's so hard to adjust, isn't it? You know, the Bible helped me so much when I moved here. I don't want to keep you from your shopping, but you can read the Bible in Portuguese on our website, and it has articles I know you'll find comforting. Ok, so time out. Now, Thais, we know you rushed that on purpose. But how did it make you feel when you did? Yeah, it didn't feel right to start witnessing so quickly, and I saw she wasn't expecting it. Right. And Carolina, how about you? How did it make you feel? It started ok, but then got awkward real fast. Right. So now maybe you can show us what it's like when the conversation will progress more naturally. Ok. Oi, tudo bem? I heard you speak in Portuguese. Where are you from? Oi, I'm from Rio de Janeiro. Oh, nice. I'm from São Paulo. I recognize your accent. I'm Thais. I'm Carolina. Nice to meet you. Wow, how long have you been here? Only three months. Well, for me, it's been three years, and the first was the hardest. Yes, we finally have work, but we are still looking for a place to live. And immigration has been harder than we thought. Wow, I'm so sorry. Do you have family with you? My husband. We had to leave our son with my mother. I miss him so much. Wow, that's so hard. But we have to keep trusting in God. In my case, it's what got me through. I know, but I still worry when I don't know what he'll do for us. Okay, so let's stop there. Really nice, thank you. So, Thais, uh, where do you feel the conversation is at at this point? Yeah, I felt like I found a good time to say something about my faith. And now she's saying how she feels. Nice. Excellent. And Carolina, how about you? It was just a nice conversation. So, when she mentioned God, it was not awkward. Thank you, sisters, for letting us learn from your conversation. I found that helpful, and I hope you did too. Make it your goal to start conversations with those three steps. Be friendly, converse naturally, and find the right time to express your faith. Practice at home or with a friend and see for yourself how iron sharpens iron. Once that potential recruit is identified, the tactics shift. The Jehovah's Witness approach becomes increasingly personalized. Witnesses may offer regular visits, empathetic listening ear, to personal struggles, and an abundance of emotional support. This targeted attention, often referred to as love bombing, creates a powerful sense of belonging and validation, precisely what a vulnerable individual craves. The love bombing serves as a gateway to indoctrination. Jehovah's Witness doctrine paints a vivid picture of a coming paradise on earth free from pain and suffering. For someone grappling with personal hardship, this utopian vision becomes incredibly seductive. Jehovah's Witness teachings position themselves as the key to achieving this paradise, fostering a dependency on the group for both emotional support and salvation. And this strategy isn't unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. Scientology's auditing sessions and the promise of hidden knowledge exploit a desire for self-improvement and enlightenment. Similarly, Heaven's Gate's narrative of mass ascension preys on the fear of death and the longing for a higher purpose, particularly among the terminally ill or those facing an existential crisis. Now, let's look at a situation where applying these four suggestions can help. So, what introduction are you using? I thought I would talk about economic problems. Hmm, good idea. And it really suits the territory. Thanks. I'll read Isaiah 65, 21 to 23, and then offer the kingdom tract. Perfect. I'll get the scripture ready. Excellent. Good morning. Many people in our area struggle to make ends meet. Do you think there will ever be a time when we won't have to stress about money? Actually, now isn't a good time. I just received some bad news. I'm sorry. We'll come back another time then. Thank you. Okay. 
Our sister applied our first two tips really well. But our sisters are usually excellent when it comes to the ministry. So, no real surprises there. Did you notice? First, she knew her territory well and had a presentation designed specifically for it. Second, her scripture and talking point were taken from the tract, What is the Kingdom of God? which as you know, is part of our teaching toolbox. However, when the householder had something else on her mind, our sister opted to return later. That could be a good decision in this kind of situation. But let's see what would happen if she were to ask just one more question and adapt according to the householder's response. Actually, now isn't a good time. I just received some bad news. I'm sorry. Is there anything we can do to help? No. I, uh... I, I just heard my sister has cancer. Oh. That must be so difficult. For your sister and for you. Yes. When someone we love is suffering, we can often feel helpless. That's exactly how I feel. If you have a moment, could I show you something that I find comforting? About a time in the near future when our loved ones will never suffer again. Hmm, I'd like that. Notice what the Bible says at Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4. With that, I heard a loud voice from the throne say, Look. Wow! Did you see how she was able to offer this woman real comfort? Just by being adaptable? All it took was one simple question. Is there anything we can do to help? She was sincere and friendly, and the householder responded. At that point, our sister applied our third tip. She obviously was familiar with some common anxieties of ones in that territory, because she smoothly transitioned to the topic of suffering, which allowed her to listen to the householder's real concern and then implement our fourth tip. She adjusted to meet those needs. Plus, she didn't struggle to find information to use. She stayed right there in her teaching toolbox. As the recruit becomes more entrenched in the Jehovah's Witness community, the tactics shift from love bombing to control. The initial sense of belonging morphs into isolation. Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine discourages outside friendships and activities deemed incompatible with their beliefs. This creates a dependence on the group for social interaction and emotional validation, making it increasingly difficult to leave. We've made the initial call and it went really well. We were able to share a scripture, we had a nice conversation, and we even left the person with a question. But then, we have to make what for some brothers and sisters is somewhat difficult, the dreaded return visit. But why do some of us feel that way? Well, we might worry, thinking, I tried to return quickly, but they weren't there. So will they even remember me? Will they still be interested? Will they ask me a question I'm not prepared for? All of these might be legitimate concerns. But we need to remember that our goal at this moment is just to continue a conversation. It's better to focus on what we do know. This person's already shown interest. Remembering that can help minimize uneasiness. But let's also look at three practical steps that give us the best chance for a successful return visit. The first step is be warm and friendly. So focus on just getting yourself relaxed. That way you can be warm and friendly when you greet them. It's natural for some of us to feel a measure of anxiety conversing with someone we don't know well. But if we've prepared well ahead of time, we can now take a deep breath, focus on the value of the message, and smile. This can help us to relax. And often our smile is contagious. I'm Laura. The last time I was here, 
We talked about who controls the world. Yes, I remember. You even showed me it is the devil, right? Yeah, that's right. If you have a few minutes, I wanted to answer the question that I left with you last time. Why does God allow suffering? Did you notice how she didn't put the householder on the spot? She reminded the woman of her name and also the topic they had discussed on the initial call. Now, she can continue her discussion right where she left Why off. Why allow suffering? I'm kind of busy right now, but do you mind if I ask you a question? Now, this is the moment we sometimes fear most. We plan to continue the discussion, but the householder has an unexpected question. So, here's one approach that works well if we would like to have more time to prepare a response. I'd like to know if the Bible says anything about gay marriage. You know, that's a really good question. Well, in a way, it does talk about that. But would it be okay with you if I answered this other question first? Then I can do some research and find the best possible scriptures to be able to answer your question next time that I come. Does that sound okay? Sure, that's fine. Did you see how our sister just gave an honest response? We can simply ask if it would be okay to continue our current discussion so we can do some research and return with a better answer. Most householders will appreciate that. But if the question isn't too difficult or we feel comfortable giving a response, that's fine. We can always adapt. The idea is to try to continue our discussion. But if necessary, we can always adjust it. And here's our last tip. Leave them wanting more. Make sure to keep our visit brief and leave them wanting more. What approach can we use? Set up a question for the next visit. Hmm, that's interesting. So this thought leads us to another question. If God allows suffering to happen, when will he put an end to it? That's a good question. But since I mentioned I would be brief, could I maybe come back Saturday? Then I can answer this question and also the other one you asked. Yeah, that would be great. There it is. Three easy steps that can help us be more comfortable and also help us make successful return visits. At cults across the board utilize similar tactics. Scientology isolates members from suppressive persons, anyone critical of the organization. Multi-level marketing schemes often target stay-at-home parents or the unemployed, fostering a sense of family within the downline, while discouraging interaction with those outside of the uh, group structure. The tactics employed by Jehovah's Witnesses highlight several key characteristics shared by most cults and eye control groups. Number one, targeting the vulnerable. Cults are adept at identifying and exploiting periods of emotional vulnerability. They seek individuals questioning their place in the world, grappling with loss, or yearning for a sense of purpose. Number two, love bombing. An initial outpouring of affection, attention, and support creates a powerful emotional bond between the recruit and the group. Number three, the us versus them mentality. Cults foster a sense of belonging by creating a clear distinction between the in-group, the cult, and the out-group, the rest of the world. This fosters dependency on the group for information and social interaction. And then there is information control. Cults restrict access to information that might challenge their beliefs. Jehovah's Witness doctrine discourages independent research and critical thinking. Scientology employs expensive courses and legal threats to limit access to unflattering information about the organization. Then the, the demands for time and money. Cults often require an, an increasing commitment of time and resources from their members. Jehovah's Witness members are expected to participate in regular meetings, door-to-door -door preaching, and attend conventions. Scientology charges exorbitant fees for courses and services. The Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults share a common strategy of targeting vulnerable individuals for recruitment, exploiting their emotional and psychological states to further their own agendas. By understanding the tactics employed by these groups, individuals can better recognize and resist manipulation, and society can work towards safeguarding those most susceptible to exploitation.
Cultivators, education, support net networks, and critical thinking skills are essential tools in combating the insidious influence of cults on vulnerable populations. Only through awareness and vigilance can we protect individuals from falling prey to these destructive groups and empower them to reclaim their autonomy and freedom of thought.